Aren't they terrific? Jeremy and Aaron are fabulous co-chairs for this program. Let's give them a hand. These two are amazing. They're so earnest and hardworking, and uh, we've been working for 21 months, 21 months to deliver this program for you. So we're really thrilled that you are all here, and we're happy, happy, happy to be here in Tucson. Uh, just a few remarks. Yes, I am Christine Cubes. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota. So happy to be here in Tucson, because at home we have snow up to our fannies, and it's very cold. But I just wanted to make a few uh, overarching remarks about the forum for this year. We are, in addition to being uh, focused on building the best construction lawyers, and in addition to being focused on our programs, our publications, and our people, we're also philosophically thinking this year about member engagement. So today when you have those opportunities to go to your division lunches and connect and network, we really want you to do that. We invite you to engage, to get connected with one another. That is one of the best business uh, points about your foreign membership is connecting and having that resource. We're also focusing on diversity and inclusion and on professionalism all year long. On the diversity point, I would just like to say that we are very committed to the ABA goals of providing diverse speakers for our programs, that we work very hard to identify diverse speakers so we can incorporate them into our programs. Every time we have a panel of three or more, we have at least one person on that panel that is a diverse person. If you would like to be considered for an opportunity as a speaker, please come forward to any of the leadership, myself, come talk to me or any of the other forum leaders and let us know about yourself. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, this is a program on risk in the new era, and I'm very honored to present our first speaker. Our keynote is futurist and applied thought consultant Simon J. Anderson, his company Venture Foresight. He is the co-author of an award-winning book, Foresight 2020, A Futurist Explores the Trends Transforming Tomorrow. I first heard Simon myself. I heard him live in Minnesota. He came and spoke to the ACEC Minnesota many years ago, five, six years ago, and he was fabulous. And so when we were putting this program together in this new decade, talking about trends and the risks that are related to them, I said, you know what, Simon has got to be our guy. So Simon has traveled more than 25 countries of the world. He brings a global perspective to his work and his insights on emerging technology have been featured in a wide variety of publications, including the Austrian management magazine called the Hernsteiner, the Executive Connections publication of the International Executive MBA Council, and just last month, he was a guest on our very own Construction Law Today podcast with Buzz Tarlow. So make sure that you go and get that podcast and listen. He's fabulous. His new book, tentatively titled Future Ready, A Professional's Guide to Creating Value in a Fast-Changing World, is due out summer 2020. So please help me welcome, very warmly, give him a, a warm forum welcome to Simon J. Anderson. Thank you. Good morning. As Christine mentioned, I am also from Minneapolis, and I am very happy to be in the sun. It's uh, pretty snowy up there right now, pretty cold. Now, just to clarify before I get started here, I am not a lawyer like many of you in the room here, but I am married to a lawyer. So uh, <laughs> when I first met my wife about 10 years ago, she had just started her practice or just started practicing. And I have learned a lot of things about being a lawyer and the life of a lawyer in these last 10 years. I think the one thing that really surprised me, though, is how often people want free legal advice. It seems like, oh, you're a lawyer? Can I ask you a legal question? It seems like that happens all the time. And before I became a futurist, I was a retail sales manager for Sprint. And I thought I had it bad with people asking me about their bills and getting free phones. Nothing like being a lawyer. <laughs> it seems like it doesn't even matter what, uh, what field the questions, and it didn't matter like this, they'd ask her questions about it. But she just has to say, you know, I'm not representing you, I can't help you, but I have learned a lot about being a lawyer from her. Now, also to clarify, Christine mentioned I'm a futurist. And uh, when I usually say I'm a futurist, people look at me and say, you're a what? So who knows what a futurist is? We've got a couple people. I know Christine does. 
Let me just clarify what a futurist is before I go any further here. Um, what I do as a futurist is I research emerging technology and trends, and then I help leaders like yourselves spot opportunities created by change, maybe spot some challenges when they're still far enough out where you can actually do something about it. But I think one of the main things I do as a futurist is I offer the perspective of an informed outsider. So a lot of times, if you're in a, in a certain field, like the legal field, for example, especially if you're like in a, a field of that field, like construction law, you go to a lot of the same conferences, you have a lot of friends in the industry, a lot of these same ideas get passed back and forth. It almost becomes like an echo chamber that can keep new ideas out. So as a futurist, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not in construction. I can see things from a different perspective and maybe help you see some things you might not be seeing, connect some dots, maybe spot some new opportunities that you might not have seen just because you're so entrenched in that industry. The other thing I do is just help you ask better questions. I certainly don't think you know that I can say in the year 2028, we're going to have this specific things that happen in this specific day, but I can help you think about the future differently and maybe ask some better questions. Of course, uh, thinking about the future all the time is, is pretty challenging. And I'll give you some, uh, some expert quotes here on the future. That first quote there is my all-time favorite quote as a futurist. The iPhone's impact on our business will be minimal by the former co-CEO of BlackBerry. So just I'll do a quick informal survey here. Uh, how many iPhones in the room? Okay. <laughs> Not very minimal. How many Blackberries in the room? You don't have to raise your hand if you're embarrassed. You still got one back there. Awesome. Okay, it's still hanging up. <laughs> I've got a friend from Toronto, and he's, he's going to hang on to his Black, because that's Blackberry is based up in Canada. He's going to hang on to that thing until the day he dies, I think. <laughs> he's so into Blackberry. But it can be really difficult, even as an expert, you know, who's very entrenched in an industry, to see how the world's moving and what could happen with the future. And it's not just individual experts, you've got companies. I'm sure you recognize these companies here. Did you know that Kodak had the first patent on the digital camera in 1975? They were so far ahead of the game, but you know what? They were making a whole lot of money selling film, and they just couldn't see the possibility to switch to digital. Does anyone know what happened in the year 2012 with Kodak? Bankrupt. Yep, they filed for bankruptcy. At one point, they had about 140,000 employees, I think, worldwide. Filed for bankruptcy in 2012. You know what else happened in 2012? Instagram sold for a billion dollars with like 20 employees. The photo sharing app on your phone sold for a billion dollars. They were just not paying attention to these, this massive trend and it completely disrupted them. They didn't, a lot of times, emerging trends and emerging technologies present opportunities. If you ignore them, they become challenges. If you ignore them too long, they become, excuse me, existential challenges. Like what happened with Kodak, what happened to Blockbuster. Blockbuster, I think they're down to one store now in Oregon. They're down to one remaining store. They had an opportunity to buy Netflix for $50 million on three separate occasions near 2000. $50 million. Of course, Netflix was a different company back then, but the, the promise was still there, the idea was still there. Does anyone know what the content budget was for Netflix just last year? How much did they spend on shows last year? Higher. Higher. Fifteen billion dollars they spent on content. Good guesses though, thank you. <laughs> Fifteen billion dollars they spent on content. This year's projected they spent 17.8 billion on content. Blockbuster was the place to go back then, though, and they couldn't see the possibilities, and now look what happened to Blockbuster. They're down to one store in, in Oregon. So it, it's pretty crazy how fast these things can happen, not just experts and not just the companies, but entire industries. You look at the uh, smartphones and cameras, it wasn't just Kodak that got hit. It's kind of like the death cross here on the, on, the, on the graph when you have a massive disruption in the, the uh, legacy industry just completely plummets and the new industry just skyrockets. I'll give you another example of an industry that was disrupted. <clears throat> the energy industry, what's happening there. I love, when I saw this, and this is from a couple of years ago, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, this is a, a perfect metaphor for what's happening right now. <laughs> they had to go to, to solar panels at the coal museum so they could save money on their energy bill. Like, what a perfect example of it. <laughs> so in your industry, how can you not be like that? What are, what are the things that you can do to, to prevent, you know, being disrupted like these other industries? So let's give you a quick uh, overview of what I talk about this morning. Talk about 3A thinking, um, some foresight factors, some things that can skew our vision of the future. 
uh, some emerging di five different emerging trends in technologies that are driving change in, in law and also in construction. Um, give you five actions for the future, so I'm not just going to come up here and tell you about a bunch of cool new stuff and say, have a nice day and walk off the stage. I'm going to give you five specific actions you can take to be more future ready. And then just do a quick closing. And also, uh, during the break, I'll be hanging around up front. If anyone wants to talk or have any questions or anything, I'll be hanging out up here. So, All right, does that sound good? All right. Well, let's start with 3A thinking. This is a, a process I've developed to help people, just something simple to remember, help people think differently about the future. And it starts with attention. Like I mentioned, you get so busy in your own industry, it's really hard to zoom out and look at different possibilities, look at things that could affect you down the line. A lot of times, these different changes kind of start at the edges, but then by the time you're paying attention to them, they're right in your face, and you have to do something about it right now, and sometimes it's too late by that point. You really have to look to the edges to get like a preview of the stuff that's coming down the line. And that can be critically difficult. I know how busy all of you are, and it can be very hard to take that, that time to, to step out of, of your industry and like look at the things that are happening at the edges. I mean, look at what happens when you don't do that. But look at what happened with, uh, with the taxi industry. In New York, they were selling the medallions that allowed them to drive for like a million dollars at one point. And all of a sudden, an app on a phone between Lyft and Uber completely dismantled their business. It was just at the edges, just in a couple cities, and I'm not sure if they weren't paying attention or what happened, but it completely disrupted the, tax, the taxi industry. You see that happen over and over and over again from companies and professionals not paying attention to things that are not directly in front of their faces right away. The second step, once you're paying attention, <clears throat> excuse me, is anticipation. So if you're an Uber executive, or if you're a taxi executive, and you see that in San Francisco, there's this new app called Uber, and the, the take rate is just, people are just signing up for like crazy on it. What can you anticipate? Okay, how could this impact my business? What can I start thinking about now while it's still at the edges? So let me ask you a question this morning here. I want you to think about when you first started compared to your job today. My question is, what has not changed in what you do in your everyday practice from when you first started? Now, if you just started six months ago, probably not a lot. Anybody more than 10 years? Anybody more than 20? So if you are doing something the same you did 20 years ago, that might be a really good place to look at what might change if it still hasn't changed for that long. Any examples of things that uh, are still exactly the same as when you started? Personal relationships, okay. Any other examples? The little hour requirement, okay. And I'm certainly not saying that everything that's done a certain way, like personal connections, is going to go away because of technology. But sometimes that's a good place to start looking is, wow, I haven't, this has been the same way forever. Why hasn't this changed? Is it because this is the best way to do something? Is this process or this policy or this tool we use? Is it because this is the best way to do it? Or is it because this is the way we've always done it? And I think a lot of times it's because this is the way we've always done it, even though it might not be the best thing uh, going forward. The last step, once you're paying attention, anticipating, is to take action. Okay. I see these things happening. I'm thinking about what this could mean for my business. What can I do right now to take advantage of this opportunity, to maybe reduce the risk in this challenge? So anticip uh, intention, anticipation, action, just a simple uh, three-word way to kind of think about the future a little differently. Now, I mentioned some foresight factors, how to think like a futurist. So before I go into my trends today, I've got these five trends I want to talk about. Before I go into my trends today, I want to share some uh, foresight factors, some, some biases and some things that can skew how we think about the future. So when we're planning for the future, I'm going to bring up these, these ideas and these, these biases to help us more think, clearly think about the future. And I want to do this first before I talk about the trends because if we're thinking in an old way of thinking, it can really prevent us from seeing new possibilities. And the first one is linear versus exponential thinking. So our minds naturally think linearly. So when we're planning for the future, we're planning for small incremental changes over time. The problem is, for decades, so many different technologies have been advancing exponentially or super exponentially on a variety of metrics, so they're doubling and doubling and doubling. I mean, look at the number of Uber drivers or the Instagram app uh, downloads. All these things are doubling and doubling and doubling. That gets really problematic when you zoom way out in the future. Let's say you're doing a 10 or 20 year plan, 
Because where you expect to be and where you end up being are very different places. And that can be absolutely detrimental to your own industry or to your own company, to your own industry. So we really need to, to recognize that we're thinking linearly, but the world is changing exponentially in a huge variety of metrics. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of what that looks like, so it's not just like this abstract idea. So this is the world's, uh, I think it's the world's first large hard drive. This is for the first supercomputer in 19, uh, 1956. Guess how much memory this hard drive held in 1956? Five megabytes. Not even close to a gig. Yeah, good guess. It. I think a gig would have been like probably as big as the <laughs> entire building. Five megabytes. You know how much memory that is? That's like one picture on your iPhone. This thing weighed a literal ton. I mean, they had to transport it by plane. So you fast forward to today, you can get an SD card the size of your fingernail with a terabyte on it. A terabyte. Think about that exponential change in memory alone. If this was advancing linearly, maybe that five gig thing, maybe it would be a gig today. Maybe after all, you know, since 1956, it would be up to a gig today. One terabyte. So you might think, well, who cares? We have way faster memory that advances exponentially, whatever. Think what that allows. Smartphones, servers, computers, super thin laptops, uh, ed Internet of Things devices, all these things just because of this one exponential change in technology. And this is happening in a variety of industries, a variety of, of devices. So it's really important to think about where this could go. Let me give you another example here. So it might be a little bit easier to visualize. In 2005, a new pope was announced in St. Peter's Square. The same thing happened seven years ago in 2013. I'm going to show you a picture of both of those events. I'm going to see if you can spot the difference. Okay, you ready? Can anybody spot the difference? Anyone? <laughs> what a difference eight years makes. Think about that. In 2005, almost no one had a smartphone. I was in the retail uh, sales uh, for Sprint. I knew, like, almost nobody even knew what a smartphone was back then. Today, 81% of adults have a smartphone in the U.S. That massive shift in technology, it's just incredible just from that one device, from exponential change in that one device. Okay, bonus question. It might be harder in the back, but who can spot the futures in 2005? Anybody? <laughs> I think in the bottom, I don't have a laser here, the bottom right corner, you got, hey, wait a minute, this one records video, okay. Like, <laughs> so they're, they're my honorary futures from 2005. You know what the crazy thing is? I think in 2021, maybe at the end of the year, that picture uh, might look a lot more like 2005 because the technology starts to disappear. Maybe you start having glasses that have cameras or that are already coming out, contacts that can record. The technology might disappear back into just not being something we have to hold and interact with. I'm not saying everyone's going to have, like, you know, contacts at a video or something by that time, but it's kind of interesting how it might kind of revert back to that picture in 2005, the next, you know, two or three years or something. So let me ask you personally, how has having a smartphone changed your life, your career? What's different now that you have a smartphone than in 2005 when you didn't? Connectivity? Yeah, you're kind of always tethered to the office. You can't be like, oh, I wasn't in the office. I didn't get the message until the next day. Why don't you answer your phone? I mean, almost everywhere has cell phone coverage. So it's good because you can catch up on, on things and not be out of the loop, especially like if something big happens or if something at your, at your firm you have to take care of right now. It's also terrible because you're on this mindset. I think you kind of, this, this, there's such a problem with society uh, adapting to this, these compressing cycles of change. Like how can we have people understand and, and live with these super fast changes? And also now, 100, you know, 24-7, we're connected 100%. And so I think mentally it's got to be kind of like a little bit of a load on our minds just knowing we're always connected and someone could send us an email at 2 in the morning that's urgent. We have to take care of it. That's very hard just to disconnect. I think that's why a lot of people like going on, uh, flying on planes and not getting Wi-Fi because just, there is no way to reach them and they can actually just let their mind relax and be like, no one can reach me for the next couple hours. I think that's a huge thing. And like every technology, you know, a lot of times uh, people think futurists just love every new technology and are super excited about it. I think that is certainly not the case. I think some new technologies are going to be fantastic. Some are going to be bad. Some will be some of both. But I think it's even more important just to know about them, you know, because they're going to happen regardless. And I think a smartphone is one of those things that's good and bad. Now you have uh, grandparents who can FaceTime with their grandkids across the country and, you know, spend some quality time with them. But then you also have, we're always connected to the office and all these other things that can happen. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of this, this dual uh, thing with technology, good and bad a lot of times. Now, if I was here 10 years ago, 
at the 2010 conference. And I showed you this picture. What would you think about that? <laughs> think how much phones have impacted our lives. And now that this is an actual street sign that people were looking at their phones and getting hit by cars, and so I have to put a yield sign up because of the phone zombie. It seems like you go to a restaurant sometimes, it's funny, you'll have, you know, some young people on a date, I'm not that old, I should say the young people, but you have a, a young couple on a date, and they're both just staring at their phones. It's like, you could have just done that at home. Why are you paying for an expensive dinner where you could just stare at your phones at home? I also want to invent a word for the amount of time it takes between when someone sits down at like a waiting room or somewhere, and between the time when they sit down and the time the phone comes up. I've just sit there, I'll just sit there and watch sometimes like in a doctor waiting room or just at an office somewhere. I'll sit down and wait, and like, I think it's under 30 seconds. People just sit down, instantly take the phone out. It's like they just can't be not looking at something now. It's just completely change their mentality. So that's the first, the first uh, thing we need to look at is just this, um, this linear versus exponential change and what that can mean in our real life, in our everyday life. The next factor I want to talk about is how our failures and even our successes can keep us from seeing future possibilities. We need to unlearn things that no longer serve. So I'll give you a quick definition here. So often we can, you know, if we've been doing something the same way for a really long time, we think that's just kind of how it should be. And it's very difficult to like recognize this no longer serves me and then think about what could replace that, what new possibilities should I be looking at. This can be a real struggle, especially if you're one of those people that raised your hand that have been in the industry for maybe 20 years. You'll have a lot of unlearning to do. You think about a, a Kodak executive. You're the, there's one engineer that developed that, um, the digital camera. They go into the office and say, look at this amazing new technology. And they look at their sales charts for the last 50 years, and they've been number one in sales, making all this money in print. They have a lot of unlearning to do to see the possibility of start working and putting money into a digital camera. I'll give you an example of my own life. So I, I became a futurist uh, full-time in 2011. In the first couple of years, an area I really had trouble with with clients was wireless telecom, like cell phones, basically. And it just, I thought we'd have a super fast internet, you know, almost free. I thought these giant phablet phones, I'm like, who's going to carry around this giant phone? Which I do now, because back then the phones were smaller. I thought these different flexible screen phones would have been out in 2013. It's like one of my predictions or something for 2013 is we'd have the, the flexible screen phones, so they're just now coming out. But I mentioned before, I was a sales manager for 10 years in retail telecom for Sprint and Nextel. Even as a futurist, I had so much unlearning to do in that industry. Even as someone who does this all day long, I think that's really a good example of even someone who does this professionally, I still had to unlearn so much just in my industry that I was in previous to my, my current industry. So it's really important to recognize what's, what's, still, um, what's still serving and what's maybe just something you've just done a certain way for a long time and then unlearn that. And I'll give you a quote that kind of sums up uh, what I'm talking about here. The great Alvin Toffler, passed away a couple years ago, just a uh, great science fiction writer and futurist. Learn, unlearn, and relearn. I think that is so critical. Learn, unlearn, and relearn. And one of the ways that I help myself unlearn is I use Evernote to store all my articles and everything. It's an online uh, app. You can store articles, and I can take them with different things. Whenever I see an article that challenges my previous way of thinking about something, for example, a bunch of these robot restaurants in, in San Francisco are closing. I thought they'd be doing a lot better because they didn't, you know, the labor costs are much lower, and a bunch of them are closing, and they just couldn't get the, the, the business model right. So I would take that article and say, this really challenges my way of thinking about the world, and I tag it as a counterpoint article. Because it kind of forces me to recognize that something might be changing different than what I expected, and then try to unlearn maybe my previous uh, assumptions or previous beliefs about that. So I think it's really helpful to have a counterpoint, however you, whatever apps you use or whatever, have a counterpoint file just to say things that challenge your existing way of looking at the world. Because that can really make you focus on, on the importance of unlearning. So for my third bias, who knows what this is? But who knows what kind of drone it is? What type of drone? It's, uh, what, this is a DJI Spark drone one about a year and a half ago. This thing is incredible. If you see the, the guy in the background, there, it's kind of blurred out. You see what he's doing? He's telling his drone to take a picture of him. So he makes a little frame with his hands. His, the, the drone recognizes that means take a picture of me, and it takes a picture. It can follow you around. Let's say you get the ski slopes. It can follow you around, fly around you, uh, manage wind, stabilize the video. 
absolutely incredible. You can still buy this drone for $399. $399. If you had this drone, and if you want to spend $1,000, you can get a really advanced drone. If you had this $399 drone 10 years ago, you'd have the FBI banging down your door asking you how you got this alien technology and where did you get this crazy drone. You can just go to online on Amazon and buy it for $399 now. Do you know why that is? This is my third foresight factor. Convergence. All these individual things are not happening in a silo. They're mixing and matching and accelerating each other. So when we started shipping a billion smartphones a year, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of pieces that are in drones got way cheaper, way smaller, way more efficient. Maybe an accelerometer would have been six ounces and 800 bucks. Now it's like a penny that's on the same chip as the, as the CPU. So as all these other things advance, it can mix and match and accelerate everything else. So it's important not to just think about these individual things. Like if you're a taxi industry, don't just think about the smartphone. Think about all the things the smartphone can allow, all the different industries that can impact. The biggest uh, nanosat company in the world, Planet Labs, their CEO said 90% of the parts in their little, their little nanosats are from smartphones. Another industry completely changed just because of the one exponential advancement. So that's my, my fourth or my third factor. Just remember that these things don't advance individually. They mix and match and accelerate each other. And that can be very important when you're planning for the future and anticipating the future. My fourth factor, are you optimizing or are you innovating? I think too often companies think they're innovating, but they're actually just optimizing an old process that's been business as usual the whole way, just made slightly better. So think about like the printing, like the printing industry, for example, it's happening with newspapers. So let's say you're a newspaper executive and you see your business declining. So you bring a consulting firm in, they six sigma your whole process, they make your printing press 8% faster, use 3% less ink, and they're like, wait, look at this innovation we have. Now we're saving 8% on our money, on our costs or whatever. But they're just optimizing an old process that's dying instead of innovating and then you know creating smartphone news and all these things that, that kind of challenge that industry. And I think that's really critical because I think so often people get focused on thinking that they're innovating, but they're just optimizing the process because it's comfortable. If you're the one making the decision, you can justify it because that's what everyone else always did. That's what we've always done. And in fact, you need to be innovating because you can just keep optimizing a dead process until it's no longer viable, until you're no longer viable as a company. I'm going to give you an example of what this looks like. And I admit it's a dumb example, but I think I remember it, so I'm just going to give it to you anyway. Who is familiar with the coffee stir stick? Who's probably used, I think, I think the average in the world is like 400,000. These get thrown away every single day. You have them in your hotel room today when you're at the, at the hotel here. This has been optimized to death. There's every kind of stir stick for different companies, tea, coffee, everything. So there's a company that thought, what are we really trying to do here? We're just trying to stir our liquid drinks. This company called Sturkle sells these little things you put in, uh, in coffee shops. You drop your coffee down, spins it up, spins it back, takes a tiny amount of electricity, no waste. So instead of trying to optimize one more coffee stir stick, They've said, we're just trying to mix coffee. Let's just make this thing that can save energy and not have all this plastic waste in the garbage. So again, I, this is not the best example, but I challenge you, next time you're getting coffee, you got your stir stick, ask yourself, am I optimizing or am I innovating? And think about maybe a process that you're doing that you might think is innovative and actually challenge yourself and say, is this really optimizing? Or is this really innovating? And my final factor that can skew how we think about the future is generational perspective. And the views of digital natives are very different. A lot of people think digital natives are like these kids. Digital natives are also much older. You know, people use millennial to talk about the kids. The, the youngest millennial now is 24 years old. So digital natives are like, just in a general, maybe like Gen Z and millennial. So it's pretty much anyone born after like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, like 82, 81, 82. Digital natives grew up with super fast technology. They grew up with fast change being the norm. That's a very different mindset than people who didn't grow up with fast change being the norm. And it really challenges how you think about everything. Now, if you look around the room today, you might notice some of us are digital immigrants. Anybody uh, classify themselves as a digital immigrant? Fast change wasn't the norm. When you were a kid, you might have the same TV your, enchi your entire childhood. You didn't have... Uh, Chromebooks at school to do your homework. 
It's a very different way of looking at the world than when your norm is not having fast change. When I was a kid, I think I was eight years old, I didn't have a laptop. It didn't even exist like that when I was eight years old. What I wanted more than anything for Christmas was one of those digital organizers. It had one line of text on it. You could put in addresses and phone numbers in there. I thought that was the coolest thing. It was like a little miniature computer I wanted so bad. My parents bought it for me. The problem was uh, I only knew like a couple people. So I had one entry for my mom, one entry for my dad, one entry for my sister, my neighbor kid that I knew. So it <laughs> didn't work out that great, but I was so excited to have a calculator on it. I can't imagine having a laptop as a kid. How incredible that, for any digital immigrants out there, how incredible would that have been to have a laptop as a kid? Doing your homework, you know, just be unbelievable. So I think that's, you know, that really can change how you think about the future, just um, not having fast change being the norm. So I'm kind of in a weird place. Like I said, you know, I'm a little bit older, but I was born the same year the, the Walkman came out. Does anyone know what year this is? And I'll give you a hint. I was born in the mid to late 1900s. So I didn't even, does that narrow down a little bit? So can anyone guess what year that was? This came out. Late 70s or close? Yeah, 1979. So this was $800 back in 1979. So <laughs> I did not have one as a baby as far as I know. I don't know. One quick question. Has anyone seen anything dangerous about, we're talking about risk today. Anything, anything dangerous about Two people using the same uh, headphone jack on, like, how many kids did they go through in this photo shoot with skin knees that kept wiping out because they were on the same, uh... so the reason I tell you when I was born, and if you're like, like me, born between like 77, 82, 81, 82, we're in a really weird place. We're either really old millennials or we're really young Gen Xers. We were born analog, but raised digital. So I, like, by the time I got to middle school, we started having like pretty rudimentary computers. Um, but I still had like a record player as a kid, although you know, now kids have record players again, kind of those things coming back. But I still had like this analog technology as a kid, but I had digital as I got older. The reason I bring that up is because if you are that person or if you are, um, you know that some, someone you're working with is that age group, you can kind of act as a bridge between the generational divide because you can kind of, you have a foot in both worlds. You can kind of understand the digital immigrant perspective, but you can also kind of understand the digital native perspective. And that can be really powerful if you're trying to recognize generational perspective. So generational perspective, like I said, is, is critically important just to think, okay, does this person, how is this person that's making a decision that I'm working with, maybe a client, how are they viewing this new technology, this new whatever? Maybe you have a new technology you want to offer them to reduce their risk. And if they're a digital immigrant, they might be looking at it from a very different perspective as you, from you than if you're a digital immigrant or a digital native. A lot of times, let's say you, have a, you get into work, you go back to the, your office, you have completely new software you have to work with. If you're a digital native, you might think, Wow, look at all the new things I can do with this new software. If you're a digital immigrant, it might be more like, oh no, look at all this new software I've learned. So it's, it's a very different perspective. And again, I'm not trying to lump everyone in just based on a certain time that they're born, but I mean, there are some similarities based on, on uh, you know, fast changing the norm or not for you. So those are the five factors, linear versus exponential thinking, unlearning, convergence, optimization, innovation, or, and uh, generational perspective. And I think if you keep these things in mind, it's going to help you think a lot more clearly about the future when you're planning uh, for fast change and trying to be more future ready. Now, you have a lot of good sessions saying a lot of cool technologies. I'm just going to touch on a few things in my session. I'm not going to go too deep on any, any one technology and one trend. I just want to bring some things to your attention that maybe are something you're not paying attention to, maybe something you are paying attention to but offer a different perspective. So again, I'm not going to go too deep in any of these technologies. I just want to kind of touch on a few things. And again, I'll be up front if you have anything you want to talk about afterwards. Before I move on to my first trend, though, can anyone tell me what's the same about all these people? Most of them are smiling. That's a great guess. They're on, if, if, if someone in this picture friend requests you on Facebook, decline. Because none of these people are real. These are generated by an AI. This is becoming a major, major problem. And now video is the next thing. One of the top experts in the world in creating these deep fakes, they call them, where it's videos that are like not real people. He said in September that he thinks within six months we'll have deep fakes uh, for certain individuals that will be indistinguishable from real video. Think what that means for risk if you don't know if a video is real or not. Think what that means for risk if someone takes one of these very real looking pictures and creates a Facebook profile and starts, you know, who knows what they want to do. This is incredibly fast that this is happening. And I bring this to your attention just because 
The first trend, which I think is kind of setting the foundation for a lot of these trends, is AI everywhere. Now, when I say AI, what do you think most people think about? Killer robots. Yeah, not just robots. Terminator robots. That's one of the questions I get asked all the time. When are the robots going to come kill us? I'm like, we got a little while. Don't worry. Because <laughs> right now, a lot of AI looks more like spam prevention. We would be up to our necks in spam if we didn't have AI that was like recognizing words and filtering stuff out and shutting stuff down. So it's stuff like that. It's not necessarily killer robots, although some of these robots, like the new dynam uh, Boston Dynamics robots are pretty crazy. If you go on YouTube, something crazy. Look at the Boston Dynamics robots. Um, and just also to be clear, when I talk about AI, there's a, a million different like cognitive computing, machine learning, deep learning, all these different versions of AI. I am just being very general here. I'm not getting too far into the, into the weeds on this. So basically what I'm talking about is a computer that does something or a machine that does something that was not specifically programmed to do. And the reason I have a picture of GPS on there is because when you have your GPS on your, on your phone and you're driving around or in your car, there isn't some programmer sitting in Silicon Valley like, okay, turn right, okay, turn left. You know, like, they're, not, they're not actively doing that. It's taking information and it's creating new information from that information without human intervention. So I'm just generally talking about that when I talk about AI, just kind of a very basic uh, definition of AI. And one of the biggest ways that AI is currently impacting our lives is how we talk to our technology. Does anyone remember, maybe the 20 plus, 20 year plusers here, anybody remember the command line interface? Okay. <laughs> if you wanted your computer to do something for you, you had to tell the computer very specifically how the computer was supposed to do it. Enter, return, run program. This is just slightly before my time, but uh, you know, return. So if anyone, if I'm butchering the DOS commands, I'm sorry, but uh, you had to know the computer's language, and if you missed a period or a, a comma, it would completely screw it up. You had to speak the computer's language 100%, or you could not use the computer. This really limited who could use the computer, because you had to speak that computer's language perfectly. Okay, bonus question quickly. Who used punch cards? Anybody? All right, I've got a couple hands here. Don't drop the stack of punch cards, right? Because it will be all different orders. Some of the digital natives are looking at me like, what? So, so the next step is, you know, we have this uh, command line interface. You have to tell the computer exactly what to do. Then you have the graphical user interface, like Windows, the GUI, the graphical user interface. So then the, to, make the, to open the printer manager, that kind of looks sort of like a printer from 1990 or whatever. And, you know, the, it kind of had little things you could click on. You're not actually writing, like, commands. You could just click on stuff. That was one step closer to a lot of a few more people to use, the, to use the technology. Now, with AI, you shift it to natural user interface. So we can just say, hey, Alexa, when's my bill due? Not command prompt, return bill, capital one, December, enter. Hey, Alexa, when's my bill due? So think what that allows. There are so many digital immigrants that are absolutely huge adopters of Alexa that have, you know, all of the houses, they can just talk to it. They just, it's, just, it's just conversational. I read a, an article a couple years ago about parents of toddlers being very concerned because their little two-year-olds are barking orders at people because they're used to having Alexa. So they're just like, play this song, do this, play this game, because they're just used to just telling the computer what to do. And they, it's, they don't have the social skills to realize that you can't just yell at humans like that. So it's, it's really changing. The other thing I think is funny, too, when you look at, um, I don't have any kids, but I have friends that have kids. If you give like a two-year-old like a magazine, they sit there and like try to, like, why is the screen not working? Like tapping on the, you know, because it's, Think of what that mindset's going to be like, you know, fast forward about 15 years. That's a whole different level of digital native when they have that level, like had an iPad in there too, you know? So let's say advancing very quickly. Amazon is now taking orders for these. This is Frame and Loop. So you can have Alexa on your ring. These are currently being, they're taking orders for this. This is a real thing. This isn't in the future. And the, the Amazon uh, Frames. So you can tell your, your ring that you need to order toilet paper. How crazy is that? You can have Alexa just on a ring, in an individual ring. So we're really shifting from you know, typing in prompts to, to, to going there. And then you look at um, language translation. Language translation is, is moving so quickly. This is the company that just said the Consumer Electronics Show a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is their ambassador with Waverly Labs. You can have up to four headsets, and everyone can be talking in their own language, and it instantly translates. Now, our language translation is not perfect yet, but we're getting very, very close. And it keeps getting better and better and better. How would your business change if you could talk to anyone in virtually any language with no like lag time, it wouldn't even matter if, if you knew what language you're speaking, you could just talk to them. It could be a client, it could be a you could have an employee that didn't even speak English, and you could just talk to them fluently with no delay in any language. 
How would that change business? You can talk to anyone, anywhere in the world that language is not a barrier anymore. I think that could profoundly change business. And even if we're not at 100% right now, when you look at how fast these things are advancing, I don't think that's that crazy to think maybe even zoomed out five years, we have essentially perfect language translation. That's one of those things at the edges we need to start thinking about right now and what that, how that's going to impact your business. You take it a step further, and this was also announced at CES, Samsung is working on a thing called Project Neon. So these are digital friends, basically. They're not really digital assistants, but they just would talk to you like a, your digital best friend. They can get mad at you. They remember your conversations you've had before, so they learn about you. This is still kind of clunky, but this is one of those other things. Like, what if you have a, an AI best friend that knows you so well that's like your best friend you could ever have that's reassuring when you did it, it makes you laugh? That could be very problematic for human relationships and all of a sudden the person you get along with the best isn't even real. So this project need, like I said, isn't perfect yet, but it's, it's just kind of one of these previews of what's coming. So how could this impact law? And I'll give you a couple examples in law. So Estonia, they call Estonia, the country in, uh, in Europe that's very, very forward-looking on technology. They were getting this huge backlog in these cases below 7,000 euros, like $8,000. So they worked on a robot judge that could adjudicate decisions under $7,000 you just automatically clear their huge backlog of cases. And if it was something that was, didn't come out right or there was some problem, it could be appealed with a human. But for the vast amount of cases, it could just run right through them. They're also working on the rights of, uh, of autonomous agents. So you already have to have insurance if you have an autonomous robot in Estonia. They're working on rights somewhere between property and human that would be assigned to the, um, the agent. That's currently in the works. The next thing is, um, who's familiar with litigation finance? People where you can have like, a, if you're not familiar with it, you can, let's say you have a really good case, you bring it to your lawyer, the case is going to cost you a lot of money to, to, to litigate. Uh, the lawyer thinks you have a really good chance of winning. They can work with the litigation finance company to fund your, the litigation finance company figures out if they think you're going to win at what percentage, and they can finance that case. So they pay the lawyer, and then if you win, they can take, take a percentage of it. <clears throat> this is a company called Legalist. They just raised $100 million for litigation finance. They're looking through tons of data, because their core function is figuring out what percentage uh, chance they think you're going to win this case. So what happens when you take tons of data, we're swimming in data, and the AIs get better and better and better, and all of a sudden you have a pretty good idea, like a pretty good percentage rate, is, are we going to win this case or not, with this judge in this courtroom, with this, kind of, with this kind of case? Then the next question becomes, if you have this software, why would it just, when you talk about convergence, it's not just going to stay in a silo, why would it just stay with litigation finance? If your firm can use technology to have a very good understanding if you're going to win the case, why wouldn't you use that? And how does it impact if you take a case or not, and it, if that could have some, some pretty crazy implications. And then you start to think about, well, what happens to lawyers with this, all this fast-moving AI? I'll give you the opinion of someone here, uh, and I, I have no answers here, but I'll give you the opinion of someone here, uh, Ben Janallery, I might be mispronouncing that. AI is not going to replace lawyers, but lawyers who use AI will replace lawyers who don't use AI. That's his opinion. Can you foresee a world where maybe you have a client, let's say five years from now, and there's some really great AI tools that can give you some really good predictions and all this extra stuff? Can you just foresee a world where you don't use AI, if you lose the case, and the client sues you for malpractice because you didn't use the tools that were available to you? Again, I don't have the answers here, but just something to start thinking about here at the edges. It's also, you know, the, the person who said this quote also has skin in the game here. This is his company, Blue Jay Legal, which is an AI company for lawyers. So again, there's some bias there, but just something to, to start thinking about here. Regardless of what happens, though, with how much investment is being dumped in making AI faster, better, more efficient, being able to do more things, we're just going to keep, this one of those exponential things, we're going to keep seeing it accelerating and being more and more fields and, and touching more and more areas. One of the best data scientists in the world, uh, Andrew Ng, said, AI is going to be like electricity. It's going to be behind the scenes in everything. We won't necessarily see it in the front end, but it's going to be kind of running things behind the scenes. I think that's kind of a good way to look at it. So my second trend to bring some attention to some things and help you anticipate a few things. Building in the future. So I'm sure you're familiar with, and we even have a demonstration right out the door here, with using our augmented reality, um, virtual reality for BIM and for design work, for architecture, for um, visualizing spaces for clients, for um, reproductions of, of scenes for, for a jury maybe. This is one of those things that the headsets are still pretty clunky. They, like this is a HoloLens, you know, it's kind of like it's not a perfect field of view. It's not super clear. This is one of those things I think we're at the very edge of some major changes happening. And one of the reasons I believe that is because of the Varro headset that just uh, was released a couple months ago. This is the XR1 headset. This is like photorealistic VR. 
So you'll be questioning, are you really seeing the thing in front of you, or are you not? is it just digitally, digitally made? It is getting so good now. We've seen a massive shift in VR where it's not just old school computer graphics. It looks amazing. This is so good, it actually has cameras that look like in the real world. So if I was wearing one, I would see all of you, but I could have like an elephant walk by in front of me because it can, it can superimpose things into the world over the real world. This is so good, Volvo was using this to test their cars. So people are driving real cars on real roads, wearing the headset because it's, there's such low latency and it's so clear, they can actually see everything in front of them. But for their test drivers, they can have a fake moose run out in front of them, or they can have a whole different dashboard so they can experiment looking at a different dashboard. If, you know, if you're in the VR industry or know about VR at all, the fact that someone would drive a car wearing a headset is insane. Two years ago, that would be completely impossible because you'd end up hitting a tree because there'd be too much latency. By the time you saw the tree, you'd already be into it. This, I think, is going to revolutionize how we visualize. Um, this is a company called VMI Studios in, in London. They, they are doing amazing work. This is a little bit older picture, but they're doing um, full renders of, of like, high, like uh, luxury apartments so clients can tour them. But they're so realistic. You look at their, if you go to their website, and, I, and again, I don't, I don't have any like financial interest in these companies. That's from bringing attention to things that I think are interesting that would be good for you to know about. Um, if you look at their website, some of their, their um, renderings of like bedrooms and apartments stuff are unbelievable. You're like double checking to, think of it, to see if it's even real. And that's not even in this immersive environment. So can you imagine walking a jury through, you know, we've, we've already got technologies out there, like even the demo out there of walking a jury through like a, a, a scene of something happening. What if they can't distinguish that from reality? What if it's so real it's just they can't believe it? How compelling would that be if you can put them in that spot and have them see that? If you're using that and, you're, and, the, and the opposing counsel is not, it's going to be a world of difference and vice versa as well. The other thing you have to think about, I think we, you know, we shift all this digitalization and visualizing these cool spaces. Who is your, when you're designing, who is this for? Who is this built environment for? And who is it not for? Who is it excluding? I have an aunt who has MS, and she's in a wheelchair, electric wheelchair. She has opened my eyes to how much of our built environment is not made for her. And I think that's very important as we're thinking about the future of design. Who are you excluding in your designs? Who can not access that? I think that's something to really, to really think about as you plan for that. The other thing is, how adaptive is it? So I live in Minneapolis, uh, freezing to the frozen north, right? <laughs> uh, I live in Minneapolis, and we have the Mall of America. And right now, they're trying to get through this massive indoor water park that'd be right next to the Mall of America. It's this big construction that they're trying to work out the financing on. One of the stipulations for the parking garage, though, is when maybe we have a lot of shared autonomous vehicles, we don't need, let's say, let's just say 10, 15 years out, we don't need as much parking. They have to be able to refit the parking garage for things like vertical gardens. The, the parking garage has to be made from the beginning to be adaptable to change the use of it when it, the current use is no longer needed. So I think this adaptive design is very, 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 very important because we need to think about, okay, this is what it's, the built environment is going to be good for now. What's it going to be good for if we're, if we're anticipating 10, 15 years out when maybe the needs change and the uses change? I think we're also going to look at how, how can we adapt it with uh, the, the major impacts of climate change. We're seeing different companies you know, making concrete that's better for the environment, maybe absorbing some CO2, maybe even a lot less in the process. Um, this big shift back to CLT, the, the cross laminate timbers, these ply scrapers you're seeing. This is in Minneapolis here. This is a T3 building. I'm seeing new projects popping up all over the place. I think Tokyo, I think they're trying to build like a 70-story cross laminate timber building. The technology is moving really, really quickly there. And that can also lend itself to prefab homes. You have, you know, constructed off-site, assembled on-site, much faster construction. Also, if you're using CLT, you can have a much smaller foundation because it's not as heavy. Now, you're thinking, wow, this guy's a futurist, and he's talking about prefab homes. And Sears was doing that in 1908. This is not a new idea, but I think the technology now is at a point where it's a lot more viable. A company called Cotera, which has had some struggles off and on, it's a billion-dollar company. But they just built a $150 million company to assemble uh, prefab stuff off-site and use AI to use every single piece of the wood. It can automatically fit everything together so you're not wasting any wood. It's been $150 million. It's a, hundred, it's a, hundred, or a $1 billion company uh, to build this, this prefab factory. That's kind of one version of automation, because a lot of that's done robotically. If you look at like BrickLang, for example, this is a Hadrian X uh, from FastBrick. So this is a BrickLang robot. This robot, the bricks are 12 times the size of a regular brick. It slaps an adhesive on there, assembles everything from a computer file. To, like, the, it's not going to put like pipes in, but it'll put the entire frame of the house in. It can lay 1,000 bricks an hour autonomously. And the adhesive seals are set in 45 minutes. 
It's this advanced adhesive it's using, and so you don't have to wait for the mortar to set for, you know, whatever the, I'm not sure, like 12, 12 hours or 18 hours or something, depending on the, the type you're using or and how humid it is or whatever. 45 minutes. You take it a step further, a company called uh, New Story, working with Icon, with the printers, is printing houses now. Down in Mexico, they're building a neighborhood of 50 houses, like 500 square foot houses. The people in that village make an average of $76 an hour, or $76 a month. They're trying to find really low cost housing to replace what they're living in before. So they can print these houses, they pop the windows and put the, you know, the other stuff in there. It's not printing pipes or windows or anything. Very low cost. They bring this, this big, this is the Vulcan 2 printer, they bring this, this big printer on site. It has like a 2,000 square foot base it can print on. It just lays down layer after layer of a specialized concrete. They put the doors in. Super fast construction, super low cost. Just incredible. You know, I think that can really impact some of the, uh, the people experiencing homelessness if you can build these villages like this. And they have a test house down in, uh, in Austin that they, that they first built. Um, a little small, like a 300 square foot version of that. Again, these things are going to keep getting better, faster, more efficient, these different processes. So that house might look like the old iPhone, you know, like the, the three watt iPhone or something compared to our other houses. But fast forward, start anticipating five or 10 years out. What does a 3D printer look like in 10 years? Are you printing 10 story buildings? Are you dropping this, a 3D printer on a skyscraper and building a skyscraper? Who knows? But something to start thinking about and start watching what's happening there. I just want to bring attention to a couple other things. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in construction I think could impact risk for your clients and also your own, your own business. So about three years ago, my sister uh, bought her first house and my wife's brother and his wife bought their first house down in Florida. Within two months of each other, this is their first house, they're so excited for both of them, both of their houses had massive catastrophic flooding, completely to the point, my sister had someone building a huge house across the street where the, the, the equipment rumbled her pipes loose. She had an older house and it, it knocked her pipes loose. They had to rip it all her floors, her whole entire kitchen, some of the walls had to come out. I mean, like, catastrophic flooding. The basement, it went, everything went through the basement. They had to rip out everything, like parts of the basement. My wife's brother down in Florida, they had kind of the same thing. They had someone come in, they got their brand new house to install their new washer and dryer. The plumber messed up, put the wrong pipe fitting in there. Three o'clock in the morning, they woke up and there were five or six inches of water in their main floor. Everything on the main floor got ripped out. Unbelievable chaos. It took them, as you can imagine, months and months. They have insurance companies. Their entire house is ripped up. You know, they're so excited. They just moved in their brand new houses. That was 100% preventable. Is anyone familiar with the FIN uh, water monitor? About $700, looks on your main water line, can tell you exactly how you're using water, what water is being used. Like, is it your faucet? Is it your washer? Is it changing? Is there a problem? It can also sense leaks and, like, pinpoint leaks and catastrophic leaks, taking it one step further than just notifying you, it can actually shut it off. So think about that. My sister and my brother-in-law could have avoided months of hassle and insurance companies and just nonsense for seven or eight hundred dollars. So to take this one step further, if you're in the construction industry or you're, if you're uh, representing construction clients, how much work is not going to be done because of these Internet of Things connected devices? If all these things are sensing and, and stopping these things from happening, think how much money and work was generated by those two incidents. That wouldn't even have happened if this thing was installed. And we're seeing more and more of these different smart devices in a bunch of different areas in the house. I think it's going to be, it's great for consumers because, you're, you know, you're, and it's great for, like, safety and loss of life and those kind of things with fires and, and flooding. But it is going to impact the industry, I think, uh, just because you're going to prevent a lot of things. Another area, I think, in the built environment that gets missed a lot is lighting. Originally, when I became a futurist, I wanted to be a futurist about lighting. I found out that no one would pay me to talk about lighting. And so I had to kind of, <laughs> kind of shift up a little bit. So I was so excited about these new lighting technologies. Talk about something that hasn't changed in a very long time. Most lighting is very similar to what, you can walk into a house now or walk into a house 100 years ago. For most places, it's pretty similar. I think we're in the edge of some transformational changes in how we light our, our, our environments. This is the wall TV, 219 inches of Samsung. So you think, well, if I buy this TV, how in the world am I going to get to my door? Do I have to build the house around the TV? These come in modular sections, super high definition. You can just fit a bunch of little sections and just fit them together. I think if you fast forward a few years, any, any surface can be a lighted surface, can be a controlled surface. You can have your whole living room look like you're standing. In, and this is not a new idea, but I think we're getting to the point that the technology is starting to catch up. It's like these like movies you see when you have, like, you walk into a room, it's like the, in, in Star Trek or something, you feel like you're right there. I think lighting is really missed, and we're still using these you know, individual point lighting. I think that's something people are thinking about. The last thing with this is we have, we're going to have 150 billion connected devices in 2025. Swimming in data, how do you understand what this means for all these different devices? I think every 
building, device, vehicle, et cetera, is going to have a digital twin, a digital representation of the physical thing. So if you build a building that's covered in sensors, you have a digital represent, representation of that building monitoring everything. It's anticipating, okay, wow, the CO2 level went up. Oh, this, the temperature is, is not working. It's, it's really cold in this one room. There must be a leak in the window. Anticipating all these things. Same thing like in a manufacturing setting. If you have a machine, it's, it can, you can run simulations on it and say, you know what, this part's going to probably break down in about a week and a half. Let's order that part right now so we don't have any, like, a three-day downtime. Well, it breaks down. We reactively order it, and then we fix it. This can, like, help anticipate it breaking and then order it automatically. So it's something to start thinking about. I think this is going to be true for buildings as well. We're going to have digital twins of buildings. My third trend here, and before I move on, so I've got a quick question. Do you think, or what job do you think a robot could never do in construction, or a machine could never do in construction, ever? And, and for 50 years from now, a robot could not do it. Sales, okay. Anything else? Anybody else? Maybe roofing or plumbing? Superintendent, okay. And I have no idea, but the reason I ask this question, when you think something you know for sure about your industry, that's a great opportunity to challenge your assumptions. So you say, you know, maybe a robot can never do, a machine can never do sales, and then take that the next step, why do I think that? What would have to happen in technology to make that possible? At what point would it become better than humans and replace them? You know, you kind of just take it further out. You may still think, you may come to the end of that exercise and still think, you know what, I, I was, I still think that. I don't think it could ever replace a human, or a human for sales. But you really make yourself justify it to yourself, and that can help you unlearn some of your maybe assumptions that maybe might not be true. So just kind of an exercise that can help you when you're thinking about help uh, thinking about the future and maybe doing some unlearning. The transformation of transportation, my third trend. So something profound happened about 100 years ago. Huge shift away from horses to vehicles. I think we're, under, we're undergoing a very similar shift right now. We're just at the beginning of it. And that's the shift to electric, autonomous, and sometimes shared vehicles. Tesla really woke up the auto industry. They had like 450,000 pre-orders for the Model 3. People were camping outside. And the other car, car companies were like, no one ever camped outside for my Chevy Cruze or whatever. You know, like, <laughs> people are waiting in line for their, for their, their Tesla or the new Model Y SUV is going to come out here in a couple months. Woke up the auto industry. Volkswagen is, their CEO just had a statement a couple days ago basically saying, we are fundamentally changing our entire business. They want to have 22 million electric vehicles by, I think, in the next uh, five or 10 years. A huge new line of electric vehicles. Daimler took it one step further, and I think it was last fall they announced they are no longer, I think it was September, they are no longer producing or developing any new gas engines or ice engines, uh, internal combustion engines. So they'll still have their current, you know, their current generation goes for years of their development. They're no longer developing new internal combustion engines for any future vehicles. Think how profound that statement is and what a, what a shift that represents with a company that size to say that. Of course, in the future, so I'm glad that our cars are finally starting to look futuristic. Uh, remember when this was the car of the future? Back in the <laughs> like, that, even as a kid, I'm like, that doesn't look very futuristic. That's like a dust buster. That was, that was the car of the future. So the other part of it is the shift to automation. You know, we see that in the news all the time. Uh, back in 2008, it's a, a big first happened. An autonomous vehicle, this cruise vehicle here, was pulled over by a police officer uh, in autonomous mode. And they said it was driving too close to a pedestrian. It said it was within 10 feet of a pedestrian. Of course, they had all the data, and they said, no, 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 we are 10.8 feet away from a pedestrian. I don't know, I'm not sure if they got out a ticket. But it's kind of a big thing that they, they got a ticket in an autonomous vehicle. Just yesterday morning, they announced this is GM's new cruise vehicle. No pedals, no steering wheel. This will just be a, a shared vehicle. They just uh, released this yesterday. They just showed this yesterday. They said they've already driven a million miles on a testing it. If it's four people, you're sitting there, it's like a living room. You're sitting there really comfortable. It's like a really nice airplane seat, basically. Drives all over autonomously. Um, and you just pay like a fee. They said it can, it can drive a million miles. I think the thing's going to last a million miles. So if you take a million miles and you amortize the cost per mile of electric with no driver, that gets really cheap. I saw one study that said it might be down to 60 cents a mile for, um, for autonomous transportation. I think it's hard to justify having your own car at that point, especially living in an urban area in the beginning. This is already happening. Uh, the villages, are you familiar with the villages in Florida, the huge uh, retirement community? Massive, like 750, 750 miles of roads. They already have uh, autonomous vehicles that can drive around these roads here. It's happening in construction. This is uh, built robotics. This is an autonomous bulldozer. And so you can go on your app and you can draw the hole that you want 
and tell it how deep it is, and it will just go dig it out for you. That's pretty crazy that, it can, that we're already there at that level. And they just raised, you get the stat here, I think they just raised like $33 million in, in, uh, a few months ago. Yeah, so in September. So it's, it's, this is a real thing that's already happening. You have delivery robots. These are all over campuses. These are little starship delivery robots for food and different things that drive around campuses. So you think, well, if I'm building a building, if I'm building a new building and it's an apartment building near a campus, for example, do I have to make a little doggy door for the robot to get in and like drive up to the people's apartments? Is someone going to de demand that? Then you look at delivery drones. UPS just started a new company called Flight Forward for delivery drones. Uh, FedEx is already delivering in two cities in Virginia uh, for, um, for Walgreens with delivery drones. You think about, well, if I'm building a new restaurant, is the restaurant going to be, could the restaurant be in the top floor of a building with almost no access for regular, for people to come up and purchase there just because it's centrally located where the drones can drop food off in like a high population area. And then you think about where are all these drones going to go? Verizon wants to connect a million drones to their 5G network. Do we want to live in a world where it's just constantly drones flying overhead back and forth? Are they going to drive over the top of roads? Are they going to drive at a certain, I mean, it's going to be a lot of change. The other question I get asked all the time is, where's my flying car? So we're almost there. This is the Boeing um, drone vehicle. So this might be a little early. This actually crashed in July. Boeing's not having a very good year, a uh, very good time. So even as a futurist, I might wait to like version five of this. But this is something that's happening. Uh, Uber's working on that. A lot of different companies are working on these, especially for big cities for like really wealthy clients. They can just fly from a skyscraper to a skyscraper without even having to deal with traffic. Um, something to kind of to think about. And the other thing is you look at the, the impact for energy. You know, if you have uh, solar panels, you know, now California has a new regulation starting this month. You have to have new construction, has to have solar, some kind of renewable on it. Um, look at the, so if you have a, a, a house, it's a regular house, you might do like three or four kilowatts a day of, of energy. If you have an electric car that's being charged in your house, maybe it's 10 or 15 kilowatts of energy you have to use. So you, you have to look at the different grid patterns and how you design your, your um, and there, I think the IEDC just did a new regulation where you have to have, or they're recommending you have like electric car plug-ins in every garage, now like one for a regular house and two for multifamily. Um, so that can really change you know, where people live, how you build the house, even for uh, commercial construction, how many electric car charges you're going to put out in front, of the, in front of the building. I'll give you one more question, kind of a crazy question, but how long before it's illegal for a human to drive on a public road? What happens if you fast forward about 10 years or something and you look at the data and the humans cause 99% of the accidents and there's all these self-driving vehicles, what happens when the insurance gets so expensive to drive yourself that it's kind of like owning a Ferrari day? Like it's just like you can't even, you know, you're not going to pay $3,000 a month to have your car because the insurance company knows you're probably going to cause an accident way more than anybody else. Again, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's just something to, to think about. So let's talk about some different risks. We're going to talk about some online risks and uh, some, some worker safety risks here. Does anyone know the first law for electronic signatures in the world? And it wasn't the U.S. That was, that was passed in 2000 for the e-sign uh, law in, in the U.S. in 2000. Does anyone know the first law permitting electric signatures for transactions? 1864, if you believe that. This is in France. They were doing, verifying banking transactions using telegraphs to like, and they actually looked pretty legit. I've seen pictures of them. They would, it would like go back and forth this like pendulum and it would copy that you'd write it, it would copy it with like metal ink, I think, and it would send it over the telegraph, and they would use that like from other cities in France to verify transactions. In the eighteen sixties, it's kind of a reminder too, some of these things we think are so futuristic, it's like, oh, somebody thought of that a really long time ago. They just didn't quite have the technology to get there. Unfortunately, as you know, our risks have changed dramatically since then, uh, with electronic verifications. Ransomware is rampant. I mean the MSOft uh, Consulting companies did a, um, a survey or a report on this. Ransomware cost $7.5 billion last year in paying out fees and lost work. Government, state courts have been hacked. Um, government's been shut down. Just crazy what's happening with, with these different um, online uh, hacks. And I think a, a huge problem, and I think this is very true in construction and in law, it's not being taken seriously like it is in a lot of other industries. And I think that a lot of, like, especially smaller construction companies, are super vulnerable to a major hack, and they're just not prepared for it, or they're too busy for it, it's too expensive to, to go against it. The other thing is a lot of companies get uh, ransomware insurance, but then what happens, they, the ransomware shuts them down, they pay, the, they pay the fee, you know what that makes? A great business model for ransomware hackers. 
because they're just going to keep getting paid out over and over again. It's like, why not? So it really kind of changes the, the, um, the incentive for them if they're just going to keep getting paid out by insurance companies. So it's kind of a, a problem there. We've tried all kinds of things to stop people from you know, hacking, like fingerprint recognition, uh, facial recognition. Of course, and what happens if your fingerprint gets hacked, you can't get a new fingerprint. A company, uh, Typing DNA, just raised $33 million. They, have, um, they can recognize how you type in very few keystrokes. It's your individual typing style to verify it's you using the computer. The next step, a company a couple years ago in Wisconsin uh, voluntarily asked their employees to put RFID chips in their hands. And so they could get, go on their computers, they could uh, go to the vending machine, they could w unlock the doors just with a little RFID chip like the size of a grain of rice in their hand. Initially, 50 people did it, now 80 people have done it since then. Some countries like Sweden, I know there's a project in Sweden where 4,000 people have the chips. Now you might be thinking, I would never get an RFID chip put in my hand for my job. Does that sound pretty accurate? Think about this. Let's say your company knows the risk of you not having an RFID chip and the possibility your, your passwords might get hacked. And they can as assign a value to that risk. And so when you're hiring someone, you get two offers. Here's your chip offer, here's your no chip offer. What if it's 50% more? What if it's, I mean, it might make people start to think, you know what, maybe I will get the chip. I'm not saying I get the chip, I'm just saying something to think about. That, so, you know, the construction industry is, I'll talk about worker safety a little bit, it's the most dangerous place to work is a construction site. The accident rates are five times higher than any other industry. So just want to bring attention to a couple of different technologies that are helping that. This is Spot R by, uh, by Triax, this little thing you can wear for, for um, people working at a job site. So the, the site manager, the, whoever the, the superintendent, whoever the, um, the, the general contractor, whoever, can see everyone on the site where they are at all times because they have these little trackers on them. If they have to do an evacuation drill, it can quickly evacuate everybody, and they can also verify everyone is off site. If someone falls, maybe they're in an area that, they, that someone else wouldn't see them for a couple hours, they can trigger and let them know that someone fell so they can go take care of them right away and, and, and uh, reduce that risk. This is a really cool technology. Another one is Doxel.ai, a startup. They use drones and, uh, and like little robots that drive on the ground. They drive around your job site and fly around your job site scanning using AI, and they, they compare the built, what's being built, to what the plans are to make sure everything's exactly to scale, and you're exactly to where it's supposed to be. And so you know right away if something is built just a little bit wrong, so you can fix it really early instead of having to like rip all the drywall off and do something all over again. It can also spot potentially dangerous areas and alert project managers before you know somebody has an accident. Really cool technology. And the other thing is exoskeletons. Finally starting to see these robotic things you can wear um, that can reduce injury, reduce fatigue. This exoskeleton from Guardian.xo can help you lift up to 200 pounds. So Delta is already testing these out on the, um, for like lifting huge tires and stuff so their employees can wear these things and they can wear it the whole shift. They can lift up these giant heavy things without having the fatigue and strain of lifting these things. So think of the worker shortage you have in construction with injuries and just the difficult work and just the, a lot of people not working in, or um, a lot of vacancies in the industry. If you have one job that offers an exoskeleton, and this is still an early version, I mean, it's still pretty huge. If you have one job that offers an exoskeleton, you come home from work, you're not fatigued, you're not tired, you don't get injured, and you have another job that doesn't, where are you going to work? You're going to work the place you can come home from work and not be sore and just be, and feel great. And I think it's going to keep getting smaller and better, and it's going to receive more and more of these on job sites. So my final trend, working in the future. I want to just bring a couple examples to your attention here. So is anyone familiar with HireVue for um, finding applicants? This is being used by corporations all over the place. Now, this is using AI. So basically, you do like a 20-minute interview. Um, it asks different questions. You just record yourself like in your laptop answering the questions. The AI through HireVue scans your video and figures out, at using 20 thousand different data points, what kind of fit you would be for that job, that specific job, not just if you're a good employee, but would you be a fit for the specific job? Hilton company uses HireVue, and they went from six weeks to five days in their hiring process because they can quickly narrow down the number of applicants and then have a human review the final applicants and do, the do like an interview after that. Of course, anything with AI, it's only as good as the data you put into it, so there's still bias issues, there's still problems with that. But I think we're going to see a lot more of this, and I think colleges are completely missing the boat here. They're not really training people for interviewing with an AI. They're still training people to do this, you know, send the thing, you know, you know, wear the right suit, all that kind of stuff. This is a very different world, and huge corporations are using, a lot of huge corporations are using this, um, this software to screen applicants now. The other thing is, and I think this is going to be huge in construction, this is where it's starting, is paying people what they earned up to the minute. So 
this is a company called Etch in the UK for construction workers. You get your Etch card, you go to work for, let's say you go to work for the first four hours of your shift, you want to take your lunch break. The four hours you earned in that shift is now available to you right now on your card to spend right now. Walmart's experimenting with a version of this. Um, some other companies are experimenting with this. Think what that means to an employee, especially if an employee is not, you know, maybe just starting out, maybe not making as much money. If you have your car breakdown and you're three days into your pay cycle, you can't wait for the, you know, you go to a payday lender and pay exorbitant amounts of money for the, a loan. Think what that means if you have all the money you earned up until that minute accessible right away. Here's the other thing. If you're hiring and you're not offering this and your competitor is, how many employees do you think are going to be like, you know, I am going to wait for your, your antiquated payroll system to issue a check or direct deposit in two weeks. That sounds like a good idea. No, it's just such an easy thing to grasp. Like, I, I earn this money, I should have access to it right now. And this is using blockchain te technology to reduce the, um, the transaction cost uh, of, that, of that thing. And I think this is something we're going to see in, in payroll pretty quickly, because I think once it starts to roll out, it's going to be very compelling to, to have this and very hard not to have this. Um, the other thing is training. We have to keep improving and adapting our training. Walmart purchased 17,000 VR headsets to train their employees, to train over a million employees, so they can put them in experiences like um, experience like what a Black Friday sale would look like, so they can be right in the chaos, right in their VR headset, and experience it before they go there. They've had really good luck with this, uh, with helping people prepare for the job. Same thing in construction. You know, you can have someone get in the lift in VR, learn all the intricacies of it, and kind of get used to that environment without, you know, really falling off the machine. It's a lot, much better to have an accident in VR than it is to have an accident in real, in real life. This is poor Barry. Barry's entire job is just to get fired for HR managers. And he has to plead with you and talk about his kids and talk about how he can't lose his job and you have to still fire him. So I think, I told my wife about this and she's like, I feel, that's so sad. I'm like, it's just a fake VR, AI, don't worry about it. It just kind of makes you feel bad for Barry even though he's not real. So what if this is, what if you have this experience for being in court? Like what if you have experience of, a, like let's say it's a photorealistic environment, you can practice in court, practice litigating, practice approaching the branch, bench, practice all these different things in VR and be completely prepared when you get there the first time. The other thing is this technology is moving so quickly. You know, I talked about the $10,000 uh, Varho headset. This is the Oculus Quest. This is $400. It's not photorealistic, but it's amazing. And they just added a new functionality that can actually see your hands now in VR so you can like interact with your environment without having to have controllers. For $400. You don't have to hook it up to a computer. You don't have to have anything else on it. It's fully self um, contained. We're going to start seeing a lot more of this because at this price point it starts to get really compelling for training, for all kinds of things, for juries, for a lot of things. And my last two things I'm going to talk about for the workforce before I give you some specific trends you can use, or some specific uh, actions you can use, are a little bit more futuristic here. Has anyone heard about Whisper? You mentioned sales. This is for, for salespeople. Whisper is an AI that's listening to your conversation that's coaching you how to say exactly the right thing to get the sale. So it knows the client information and it can like listen in real time and tell you how to change your, change your approach, different words to say to have better results in sales. There's another version that's for call centers called Balto that's listening to your whole conversation. It's, 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 it's actively coaching the people that are, on the, that are on the call in the call center to sell more, like reduce client problems or, or customer service, anything like that. This exists today. And the other part of this, which is not associated, but I'm combining these, converging these together, is Crystal. I was a really, I was invited to be a really early, early user of this, probably back around 2015. Crystal takes all the information available about someone online and creates a very specific personality profile with an accuracy rating of how confident it is of that, of that accuracy. And it coaches you how to write emails to them. It says, no, change this word. That's too, it needs to be more concise. No, add this other word. It's crazy. It pulls all the information from the LinkedIn profile. I quickly stopped using this within a very short amount of time. I didn't really tr try it with anyone. Because to me, it, and I'm not, I, I'm not the judge of this, but to me it seemed like, personally it felt maybe a little borderline unethical to like know that much about someone and know exactly how to approach them to, to get them to what you want them to do, to sell them something, to get them to do something. But this is a huge company. This has been used, being used by a lot of other companies. And I'm not saying anything bad about them. This is interesting technology, just my own personal feelings on it. But if you take it a step further, what happens if you combine these two things? So what if you have a crystal level understanding of the client you're talking to by pulling the data of all their social media stuff, all their LinkedIn stuff, and you have a whisper type device that's telling you exactly how to do this, how to sell them something? I think that starts to get pretty interesting. Maybe you feel like you don't want to use that, but what if your competitors do use that? What if you're arguing in front of a judge and it's telling you real time what's going on? 
I remember my wife told me when she was in court, one of her first times in court, she was second chair, and she had to pull up some case law quick, and she just pulled out her iPad and pulled up the case law, and everyone looked at her like she was an alien, because I think it must have been the first time in that court that they did that. So she's just pulling up case law on the fly, and was like, what? Extrapolate this out. If you have somebody, if you have an AI telling you exactly how to approach this judge or litigate this case or work with this client or work with this jury, I mean, I'm not saying this exists today, but I'm just something to start thinking about, that this could be really interesting in the future. So, now that I dumped all that information on you, I'm not just going to walk away and say, have a nice day. I want to give you some really specific things you can do to be more future ready. Give you some actions here. The first one is just remember those five things that can skew how we think about the future. Because if, if you can actively think about these things, you can have a much clearer understanding of some of the possibilities and be a lot more future ready. If you can get rid of some of those biases and think differently about the future. And the second action, this is a great place to do it, a meeting like this, get with some of your team that you work with, somebody at your firm, conduct a pre-mortem. Not a post-mortem, a pre-mortem. Pretend it's five years from now and your firm is out of business. What killed it? Flipping it around and looking into the future and, and kind of trying to anticipate backwards what the different challenges are that are at the edges right now that could potentially kill your firm or even just maybe hurt your, hurt your overall revenue. If you can zoom out and try to look back, Changing that perspective can be so powerful because now you still have time to do something about it. I'm not saying that's, you know, your firm's going to go to business in five years or something, but it can be, even if your firm is still fine in five years, this can be really powerful to help you even be that much more successful by understanding some of these challenges and then start anticipating and taking action right now. The third thing, and I mentioned I know you're all very busy, I think the future is so important. It demands you set aside time every week to think about it, to anticipate, to think of some actions. I challenge you to put on your calendar every week a future 15. So every week, take 15 minutes, put it on your calendar, and this is untouchable space. Everyone in your office knows that my future 15, I'm on my future 15. I'm reading websites outside of my industry to learn about you know, quantum computing or maybe look up Whisper or look up some of these different technologies I talked about today and start thinking about how this could impact my firm and my life and the different opportunities you could have. I'd even take it one step further, and I would challenge you to put your future 15 on the busiest time of your week. So let's say typically every Monday at 10 a.m. is super, super busy for you. Put your, your future 15 at Monday at 10 a.m. because you're signaling to yourself and to your team that this is that important. The future is that important to be thinking about. We can't wait till we're just disrupted. We have to be thinking about this right now. So put that in your account. That's my challenge to you as you go back to your offices next week. Then once you're thinking about that, say, what if, what then? What if my opposing counsel is using a, a tool like Crystal? What then? How can, I, how can I work with that? What if drones are becoming ubiquitous for deliveries and it's completely changing my, my, uh, construct, my uh, commercial industry for restaurants? What then? What can I do right now to be more future ready? And finally, I recommend you get a reverse mentor. If you're a digital immigrant, work with a digital native and vice versa. You can see a very different perspective and way of looking at the world. Goldman Sachs is um, interviewing their interns every year, getting their, their, uh, their young interns, like their Gen Z interns, getting their feedback to kind of see what they're not seeing. I work with uh, Jack Aldrich, a guy I wrote the book with. Um, he's a generation older than me, a future older than me. He's my, reverse, he's my mentor. I'm his reverse mentor. I help him see a different generational perspective, and he helps me with his experience and all those great things he's learned. It has been so powerful. I've been working with him since the beginning. A reverse mentor, even just once a month, he was a reverse mentor, just to help you see what you're not seeing. So in closing today, I think business as usual is no longer viable in the world moving as fast as our world is moving. And I really I challenge you to pay attention to how fast the world is moving. Look at these things at the edges. Start anticipating, thinking, what if, what then? And take action to turn those possibilities into reality. Thank you.